James Soombi, born and raised in Los Angeles. My mom was uh, early on into like uh, West Montgomery jazz guitarist. Um, you know, so it was a little of that. Um, and the records we had, um, you know, I remember like when The Wiz came out. So that was a big record in our household. Um, man, we had, we had a little bit of James Brown. Um, and then I remember right around that time, I mean, funk was starting to come up when I started really being aware of music. So funk prior to hip hop was a primary source of music, um, you know, and obviously that's anything from Funkadelic, Parliament, George Clinton, Zap. Um, going into when Rapper's Delight came out, I remember, you know, I, I even remember sitting in a parking lot in my mom's car hearing that come in on the AM radio, uh, Rapper's Delight, like, every kid I knew had to memorize it, we all memorized it, and then, you know, that took over, and then that just created, you know, that was a revolution of music in my mind, and yeah, from there, that, you know, hip-hop. <laughs> Everything hip hop sprung from Rapper's Delight, and being a West Coast, I mean, that was our first exposure. There were no block parties, there was no. Um, but I found, you know, I and the kind of the people I gravitated towards started to prefer a East Coast flavor of it, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, we had the LA Dream Team and we had like the Wrecking Crew, World Class Wrecking Crew, and a lot of more like the digital, closer to disco tempo. Uh, you know, 120 beats per minute and faster type tracks. I tended to gravitate towards the slower, East Coasty, you know, substantive uh, 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 rap. So, um, I mean, in a nutshell, that's pretty much how it all evolved and developed. From what you could hear, you know, because LA is, is not like New York in the sense that, you know, like New York, as I understood it, because I mean, I, rem I remember even like, you know, and I was, a, I was a good student in school, so I was one of those kids, I was like a bookworm kind of good kid. So I always wanted to devour any written material I could find on hip hop in the beginning, and it was very sparse. There was no source magazine, there were no, uh, you know, rap sheets or any, nothing, nothing was available. So, you know, and I remember when Wild Style first came out, and I must have lost my mind. I think that was on like KCET, which was like Channel 28, you know, back in the day. And, you know, we lost it, Fab Five Freddy and the whole thing and all that. So, you know, all we were getting exposure to, you know, LA wasn't like, you know, like, it wasn't like I hung out in Inglewood. So I didn't know Inglewood rappers. I didn't know South Bay rappers. I didn't know Valley rappers. You know, I lived in LA, pretty much kind of mid-city area. Um, and all we had was like World on Wheels and, um, which is a roller skating rink, kind of in mid city, and you know you had the like um, you know, Uncle Jam's Army was a big thing, and that was kind of more you know funk and, and disco y, um, soulful kind of stuff. But um, yeah, there was no, there wasn't anybody doing East Coast style stuff, you know, that I could say, you know, outside of our circle. Once we started up, you know, um, you really didn't. I personally really didn't have that connection. <clears throat> to know a lot of people outside of the circle. Middle school, junior high school, I went to Bancroft Junior High School. Um, and just let me backtrack a little. I, have, I had a musical background to that point. Um, uh, I went to private school up through, up to the fifth grade. And uh, there was a small band, and I, I played trombone in that band. And I have two brothers, and they're each one and two year front, so we're one year apart, all three of us. And um, so we made up like three eighths of that band. It was a small band, um, you know, and I played trombone. So going into, a, um, I don't know if you remember when the, you, well, you don't, you're not from LA, but the, there was a thing called the Magnet School Program came out and it was basically um, sort of a means to diversify um, school campuses um, ethnically. Uh, and, and give kids these enrichment programs where each school, you know, uh, specialized in a particular craft. And so there was performing arts, there were uh, medical magnets, there were math magnets, there were science magnet schools. Um, I, I my, um, it's my phone. My mom pushed us into. Uh, she wanted to get out of the private school system and get us into the public schools, and she felt that was an opportunity for us to, you know, get an education she thought was uh, fruitful. And uh, because we played music, she was like, "Ooh, performing arts made sense." So I got accepted, and then went to a, um, in sixth grade. I went to my first public school, uh, and it was a performing arts magnet, and I played trombone. And I was pretty good. 
Um, I even got like um, some like scholarships for free lessons and things like that. Went on to the Magnet Middle School. So it was a performing arts middle school. And if, if you think of it, it was kind of like fame light. You know what I mean? It wasn't um, so intense, but it was just a, a school of kids who all wanted to perform if you were in the Magnet program. So there was drama, there was like artists, and then there were musicians and so forth. And I was in the orchestra and the band sort of a thing. And I also picked up the French horn. So I played trombone and French horn three years there. <clears throat> but one thing they used to do uh, when I became a, what was called a senior then, it was junior high school, but that would be, uh, I believe, ninth grade, eighth or ninth grade. Um, that that group of kids who were going to be graduating on to high school, they we had a, a, a quad area, and every Friday we could bring our records and play records. And I remember, um, like Run DMC came out their first album, so that's like '86, I believe it was. Um, man, or you know, um, that was like. As a matter of fact, no, I was like '84. It had to be '84. Yeah, that's when I graduated. '84, not '86. What am I saying? So uh, in '84, I had that record. We would play it. You'd hear it. Um, didn't really like span or nothing. We just wanted to hear records that we liked. And this idea of like having records and bringing them uh, was just intriguing. Um, when I moved on to high school. Um, this was this, there was this idea of like forming crews, you know what I mean? Um, I happened to develop this ability to beatbox, um, and I wanted to DJ. Like DJing was really cool back then too, and a lot of that probably was influenced by like the Dr. Dre Rokas Wrecking Crew kind of circuit of people, you know, guys who had two turntables and then they seemed to command a party with the big speakers. So that developed early in high school. So late you know, um, middle school and then early high school. Um, and then by my second year in high school, I pretty much had convinced my mom to get me turntables. And, you know, every weekend I would go record shopping. We'd go to the rhodium. Uh, you know, um, I used to get an allowance. And, you know, back then, I remember 12-inch uh, singles were like three ninety nine. It was like four and a quarter with tax. So I could get like four records. So that either be like two doubles or that would be like four individual records. You know, you'd always be in the record store like, ooh, I, I want double so I can spin, but mm, four records is four songs. If there's four hot songs, I want to have the hot song, you know. And you know, that, that started the compilation of our, uh, you know, a record collection. And I had a partner, um, he's actually uh, um, uh, Mellow D, the Freestyle Fellowship, uh, Daryl Alex. Um, he, you know, we, we kind of clicked in high school and um, that's when we started this idea of like we need to be a crew. Um, and then, you know, we we weren't one of those like incredibly prolific house party teams. You know what I mean? We the strange thing is is I think we in our minds held ourselves to this elite class like we're better than everybody. So we kind of looked down on the whole LA scene. Like we were like, oh, they don't get like what is this up tempo? Hip hop, like I, I don't dig it. They don't know about this East Coast stuff, and we would go get the East Coast records, and and, and that was the world we kind of in our minds were in, um, and, and so we envied to kind of make that kind of music. Um, so that developed into you know you'd hang out with guys at lunchtime and things, and we were in need of a rapper. You know we were two DJs with our little crew in our heads, and we we did like one or two house parties, but it wasn't anything prolific. We would make our little mixtapes. That was one thing we were kind of prolific with, was making these little mixtapes and so forth. We did pause tapes, we did actual DJ tapes, um, and I had this little system in my house. So friends would come over and be like, "Oh, James has turntables. He has a speaker, and he has you know the setup." So, <clears throat> yeah, we we um, eventually pulled in this guy uh, to rap with us. His name was Vernon. Um, and that was us. We had one rapper, two DJs, um, and even in that, we were kind of, you know, trying to record more than perform. So we were trying to make music. We weren't trying to be out in the world necessarily. Uh, I used to remember, you know, every now and then it would be like, it might have even been like weekly on Fridays in high school, they would invite talent to come to the school and perform for the school. Like, you know, so every now and then, you know, you'd have some DJ crew was set up in our quad area in high school and they do some sort of performance. We never like sought to be in any of that kind of thing. We just were kind of doing our own thing on the side, making music, you know. 
Um, uh, I fondly recall going to uh, West LA Music, which was, you know, like the Guitar Center type of store you could go to. We went there. We went to this place called Hollytron. That's where I generally got my turntables and stuff. It was like a, it was almost like a Best Buy before Best Buy. It was, it was a one. It was a kind of a mom and pop because it was only one. But they used to advertise in the LA Weekly every week, and they used to have turntables, and they had 12, they had it all displayed at a DJ section. It was really exciting to go there. Um, you know, so we'd go to these local stores and places. And, and acquire equipment, acquire, you know, uh, at West LA Music, you know, we managed to convince my mom that we were going to pay her back and we got our first four track. Um, and then we made like a four track tape, you know, and a four track allows you to, you know, uh, do overdubs, uh, which is that ability to record something and then play that back and then record something else on top of it. So once we had a four track, it was on. Like we were able to make like these, what we thought were like high level, ridiculous mixtapes, you know what I mean? Like we would make, uh, call and answer tapes like one record would say one thing and then we'd have the answer on the second track Then we would have something else going on the third track, you know, and we made these these masterful little tapes And they kind of got popular people around wanted to do them, you know, and that slowly evolved into producing that slowly evolved into Well, you know now I'm a connoisseur of beat and I'm a connoisseur of rap style and I'm a connoisseur You know you, you in all that, you know mixing and turntabling you start to notice what parts of the record you want to break down. You know what I mean? I used to remember uh, reading about, um, you know, Billy Squire, Big Beat, when Run DMC busted that uh, track on that. We went and found the record and bought the record. And then we went, do, do, cat, boom, boom, cat, boom, boom, cat, boom, do, 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 you know, and you got into it and you tried to recreate the record in our house, you know. And let me back up a little on the fact that we didn't have 1200s. If anybody who knows about turntables, 1200s were like the industry, they still are the industry standard, you know. But back then and today, they're still high level, expensive turntables. Um, you know, I was able to convince my mom to buy, they were called BD10s. They were Technique's brand, but they were BD10s. And these are belt drive turntables versus magnetic drive. You know, um, 1200s are magnetic drive, they're very stable. You could t dang near sit on it and it won't wobble, it's very sturdy. These BD-10s kind of wobble. We used to wedge paper in it to make it sturdy. We'd put money and coins on top of the head you know, piece to hold it down. So, I mean, this evolution process, it, it, it was like you know, making the most out of what you could because you loved the music so much, you know what I mean? Um, and we wanted to emulate what we liked, what we heard, and, and it wasn't happening locally. All we got was like what K-Day would play you know, or what you can maybe find at the rhodium that somebody, you know, because Dr. Dre apparently was blowing up the rhodium. And so he was, he was influenced what was coming in to be sold at the rhodium. And then we were kind of going in and picking up the scraps, you know what I mean? Um, so these little breakbeat 12 inches out of New York started showing up and, you know, all kinds of things that were East Coast influenced. That was what we were seeking. That was like our, you know, we were magnetically charged to find that. And, and, and a lot of the West Coast stuff we kind of shunned. We were just like, this is too close to disco West Coast stuff. It's too up-tempo, it's too non-substantive rap, you know. We wanted to be like Run DMC. We wanted call and response MC and we wanted all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, um, high school, you know, we had this rapper, we had me and D, you know, um, uh, and we started making beats and so forth. Um, uh, graduated high school, uh, graduated class of 87. Um, <clears throat> I went on to a junior college, a Santa Monica College, and I got a job uh, working at a sandwich shop. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I was, I, I gotta say, I was probably a nerd. I mean, I used to read the paper, and, you know, and I was a student. I was a good student, you know. I did play football in high school and so forth, but, you know, I was pretty much a nerd. I was, I was a bookworm, you know, studious, studious type of person. And um, I remember one day I was reading the LA Sunday section of LA Times and they used to have the calendar. I used to always love the calendar because it would tell you what was hot. And that's where you could find information on East Coast artists and stuff. <clears throat> These local cats who um, apparently got on a soundtrack for this movie called Big Shots, um, they were a feature and they were a local story. It was like these kids uh, at uni high school, right? And I remember seeing the article and it was like, you know, these MC Jam and Pee Wee Jam, these two guys, and they made this song and they got on soundtrack. They made David, David Kirschenbaum, the famous guy who signed uh, Tracy Chapman, you know, very famous producer, David Kirschenbaum. And he was the executive musical director of this movie, Big Shots, with like Carl Weathers was in it. And it was a really bad movie, but 
anyway, the, that caused us to meet what later became Ganja K. And um, uh, his partner at the time, who re he's rest in peace, he's passed away. Um, he was actually murdered um, years ago. But um, so these, we met these two MCs, and then that was a whole new world of, of, of artists who kind of had East Coast sensibility like we did. They found themselves in that circumstance of getting to do that um, performance. Mm -hmm.